Okay, guys, so we're adding a lecture this year, and don't worry, it's very brief and not a lot of information to learn, but it's something that we think you need to start uh, being aware of, and it's the pelvic floor. You will learn how to assess and treat it slightly in uh, therapeutic exercise, which is, of course, coming up for you this year, so um, you need some background information so that you can jump right into assessment and treatment and not have to learn what the muscles are. So we're adding this to the content of curriculum because it is a growing area of practice specialty in physical therapy. A lot more therapists are specializing in pelvic floor and pelvic, uh, pelvic disorders. It, used, it was always a fairly prominent area um, involving females because of labor and delivery and pregnancy and the issues arose with that. But it's really growing now in the management of male issues, a lot of male prostate and urogenital issues. So it's a growing area of practice and one that even if you choose not to treat this area, you should be aware of the problems that can be caused by the pelvic floor musculature and refer your patients to proper um, places, you know, proper people who are specialized in the area. Um, the other issue is that there is a lot, it's very closely proximate, proximated to the hip musculature. The piriformis and the obturator and turnus are very close to the pelvic floor. So um, it's difficult and it's not quite accurate for you to assess the pelvic musculature without considering the effects that the pelvic floor muscles might be having on your patient's issues, especially pain related in the lower abdominal or hip area. Okay, so first here what you have is um, a male and a female pelvis. Okay, so here's your male pelvis and here's your female. And what I want you to notice is two things, the size of the opening, right, and the shape. It's a smaller, somewhat more slightly rectangular, whereas the female's pelvis is larger. Oh, the inlet is larger and rounder. And the other thing to notice is this, um, the pubic arch is what we call this pubic arch here, and how narrow the male is, and how much broader and wider the female is. And obviously these differences are primarily due to labor and delivery and the ability for a female to be able to deliver children. Okay, so we learned already about the thoracic in green and the abdominal cavities. And the pelvic floor actually exists in the pelvic cavity, right? So it's this red area down here, the pelvic portion. It's considered a portion of the abdominal pelvic cavity, but for simplicity's sake during the lecture, we'll just call it the pelvic cavity. Um, in the top right picture, you have what we call the pelvic diaphragm. And these are the muscles that we really care about here in the pelvic area. And We'll talk, that's primarily what we'll spend talking about um, in the lecture. And what I want you to notice, because this image shows it nicely, is how it, although this whole thing is the pelvic diaphragm, I want you to notice how it sags down and it creates sort of a bowl. It is really a, a bowl in the bottom of your pelvic area. The pelvic cavity itself is bounded by bony, ligamentous, and muscular pelvic walls and floor. It's the inferior posterior part of the abdominal pelvic cavity, right? Inferior and posterior part. Um, and it's continuous with the abdominal cavity right here at the pelvic inlet. So again, it is truly considered the abdominal pelvic, but for our purposes today, we'll call it the pelvic cavity. Pubic symphysis and the bones of the pelvis bound the cavity. The lateral walls are padded by the obturator internus muscles. Okay, so there are pelvic muscles already. And the sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments form the greater sciatic foramen in the posterior wall, and that greater sciatic foramen is filled by your piriformis muscle. Okay, so here are your piriformis and your obturator internus muscles actually as part of the pelvic cavity. So they really can't be considered just as hip muscles. They do have an effect on the urogenital system as well. So the pelvic cavity itself contains the terminal parts of the ureters, the urinary bladder, the rectum, the pelvic genital organs, and blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves. Don't worry, we're not going to be concerned about all that stuff. What I do want you to worry about is this pelvic diaphragm. So the pelvic cavity is limited inferiorly by the pelvic diaphragm. I mean, that's that muscle I showed you that for, sort of folds, for, forms a bowl or a sling at the bottom of the pelvic cavity. So it's sort of suspended, suspended above, but descends centrally to form that bowl. It descends to the level of the pelvic outlet, forming a bowl-like pelvic floor. Those are the muscles that we're really interested in. And that pelvic diaphragm consists of primarily two muscles, the coccygeus muscle and the levator ani muscles. 
there is also fascia covering the superior and inferior aspects of these muscles, right? Just like we had visceral fascia, um, we have fascia around these muscles as well. So the coccygeus muscle itself um, originates from the lateral aspects of the inferior sacrum and coccyx and attaches to the deep, deep surface of the sacrospinous ligament. The levator ani, which is the larger and more important of the muscles when treating pelvic floor disorders, is, uh, originates on the bodies of the pubic bones, the ischial spines, and attaches to the thickening of the obturator fascia. Okay, so here you have your images. This is the one I want you to look at. So here, all of this right here is your levator ani. Okay, it's bilateral. Right here it is on the other side. So this is your levator ani made up of your puborectalis, your pubococcygeus, and your iliococcygeus. Okay, and then you have your coccygeus muscle back here bilaterally again. Okay, and then look what is right here. There's your piriformis. Okay, your piriformis is right next to your coccygeus muscle. And I would bet on many of the cadavers that we see a strong fascial connection between this piriformis and this coccygeus muscle. Uh, so not only does your piriformis have a big factor in hip and low back disorders, but it can also be a very big factor in uh, pelvic disorders. And here is your obturator internus, right, lining the inside the pelvis wall. So it too, other than this, this is the tendinous arch of the levator ani, so you can see that there is a continuum between the levator ani and the obturator internus again. Okay, so these are the muscles I'm primarily concerned with you um, learning about and understanding, and these are the ones that I do want you to know. So the levator ani forms a uh, dynamic floor for supporting the, the abdominal pelvic viscera. Okay, so it's sort of the sling that your abdominal pelvic viscera is sitting on. It is tonically contracting most of the time. Tonically means it's a low level contraction. Right? We talked about that day one briefly. It's a low level contraction that you don't really realize you're firing, but the muscle is firing almost all of the time to support that viscera and assist in maintaining urinary and fecal incontinence. So picture a six to eight pound baby sitting on that pelvic floor for, you know, six to nine months. So they're small at first and then they get larger, of course. So these muscles can become weak, overstretched, right? Especially if you have a large pelvis and that baby is really sitting down inside there. Not to mention the way these muscles have to react when uh, a woman goes through labor and delivery, right? And the, and the damage that can occur to this musculature of labor and delivery. And a lot of women have uh, what we call urinary incontinence, postpartum incontinence after delivering their children. And it's mostly because these muscles have been stretched to, you know, their limits and they're not tonically contracting, or they're not contracting strong enough, or they're overstretched to hold up those the pelvic viscera, and, and that's how you get some leakage. So um, the levator ani, though they're always tonically contracting, they actively contract during forced expiration, coughing, sneezing, vomiting, and fixation of the trunk and carrying a heavy load. Because again, when they have to support that, that pelvic viscera, so when there's an extra weight added on to that pelvic viscera by one of these activities, or you need greater force to stabilize them, the levator ani actively uh, contracts. Now, the other thing is that the, the levator ani actually has to relax to allow urination and defecation. Okay, so picture the issues if you have an overactive or a spastic levator ani. If that muscle is spastic and is not going into its relaxed state, you're going to have difficulty urinary, urinating, right? And what do a lot of males with prostate problems have, do, have trouble? They don't have a steady stream of urination. It's stop and go sort of thing. So most likely, it's possible that this levator ani is not relaxing sufficiently to allow them to urinate. Okay, so that is it. A very brief introduction to the pelvic floor. We're going to try to look at this in the lab after we take out the abdominal contents and see if we can see um, some of this musculature. We are not experts at uh, dissecting the pelvic floor, but we're going to give it a shot and see if we can see some of these musculature. Okay, I'll see you in lab.